All right, well, let's get started. Um, my name is Sarah, I'm the researcher at the Rosso Museum, and I coordinate our museum speaker series, and we're excited. This is sort of a special event for us. And we're co-hosting with the City of Rosso Heritage Commission, so thanks to them as well. And to our regular uh, speaker series sponsor, the Trans District Arts Council. Um, so, I first would like to acknowledge that Rossland is on the unceded territory of the Sinaites Nation. And um, I'm going to also introduce Harry. Buckle up. This is a very uh, talented, multidisciplinary guy who's done all sorts of stuff. So it's long and it's the short one. So be ready but for this. A lot of people know me here. <laughs> so. Okay, so you can fact check. If I say things that are not true, you can just yell, not true. <laughs> Bullshit. Okay. So. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce, introduce Harry Measure, who will be our presenter today. Originally from Trail, Harry Measure grew up on the slopes of Red Mountain and was very active in the Red Mountain, Mountain Raising Program. His passion for the ski, sport of skiing shaped his career goals to become an urban planner who designs resorts, communities, and buildings in the mountains. He obtained a master's degree in architecture and environmental design from the University of Calgary and studied at the San Francisco Center of Architecture and Urban Design. Harry has done pioneering work inventorying heritage architecture in West Kootenai Mining Town and developed the Downtown Heritage Conservation Guidelines for the City of Nelson. He was the development planner for Whistler in the 1990s during its most intense period of growth. Harry is globally recognized, a globally recognized expert in resort, recreation, and tourism design and development, having worked on over 150 major projects all over the world. He has completed numerous projects in British Columbia's mountain resorts and communities, including Rossland, Fernie, Revelstoke, and Whistler. Harry has taught and lectured widely at educational institutions, conferences, and to interest groups. His March presentation on the Miners Union Hall, this building, and Rossland's provincial courthouse is available to view on our website, the museum's website. When not in his living laboratory of Whistler, Harry travels extensively to observe and document emerging global trends in resort, recreation, and tourism design. He writes on subjects related to architecture, design, cultural history, and tourism. Today, Harry is here to speak about something he's very passionate about, mountain resort community development. Development and planning decisions can have huge implications for resort communities and often determine if a community's unique and authentic sense of place is maintained or destroyed. Harry will analyze the mountain resorts of the Columbia Basin and share some of the insights he's acquired from his work all over the world as we all consider possible futures and opportunities for our golden city. So, over to you, Harry. Well, um, the first time I've been in this room since 1978. When I was in here, press metal was hanging from the ceiling. The structure was damaged, and it was on its way out. So, they've done a great job. Really fantastic. Um, Can everyone hear okay? So, yeah, so. Okay. Uh, I guess I'd like to get to know the audience a bit more. How many of you are native to the Lawson Trail area? Born and raised here. Okay. Um, how many from outside the Kootenays? Okay. How many from outside the province? Okay. How many from outside Canada? Okay. Now that's not 103 population south we need for proper statistics, but it does help me. Um, yeah, as Sarah was saying, I live in my laboratory at Whistler. Uh, over the last 30 years I've seen a lot of new concepts in resort design and development and operations being tested and had the opportunity to evaluate them for success and failure. Um, and I'm going to discuss some of that with you today because I believe with Rawson and the way COVID and amenity migration is occurring globally, especially in the Intermountain West, we're going to have severe growth challenges. And we'll discuss that later, because there's been a lot of very good research come out lately. Uh, as Sarah mentioned, I've been very active traveling in the Intermountain West since about 1975, first photographing historic mining towns and architecture, and then, as well, later on, um, photographing resorts and what makes them work. Good examples, bad examples. So with that, I'll start in. Now, I do have uh, presenter's notes, but over the years I've just been adding to them. So now they're really not presenter's notes, they're more reference. So, for later, for questions. So if you have questions on any of the slides, we can go back 
and I have a lot of data uh, available. So mountain resorts, first of all, interest in mountain tourism, tourism in mountain regions in the world, the first forms are along sacred uh, pilgrimage routes, but modern tourism, as we know it today, really started in about the 18, or 1690s with the romantic writers and adventurers, very few of them going to the Alps. Uh, by, the early, by the early 1800s, uh, the romantic writers and painters like Ruskin um, and Shelley were traveling and writing and painting landscapes, Turner. And because of this rise in the romantic movement, uh, a lot of the youth did what we call now a gap year, especially out of Britain. So between going to university and getting trained for administrative positions like the East India Company or government, uh, they do a year going to Paris, going to uh, Venice, Rome, Florence, to look at historic architecture and antiquity. And also, they would include in this a tour of the Alps. And they include in that trekking as part of it. With that exposure, popularity grew in the Alps with uh, wellness, going to the uh, uh, hot springs, doing what's called taking in the waters. And it was a very uh, opportune time, really, because Britain was at the peak of the industrial age, and the major towns were polluted. There's a lot of tuberculosis. Sanatoriums sprung up. Um, this is a, yeah, the various romantic pages. Uh, Turner's Avalanche in the Alps, and Wander Above the Fog, Sea of Fog. So before this period of romanticism emerging, the mountains were viewed as, I guess, the domains of, of demons. So they were not entered at all. Okay, next slide. Okay, so as these alpine venues grew in popularity, hotels were built, sanitariums were built, hot springs were built, like in San Ritz, that's the hotel where the drive in San Ritz. Uh, also, uh, winter tourism was introduced. One of the, the owner of the Hotel Bourdrat in San Marins challenged a British aristocrat to come to the Alps and he'd enjoy himself in the winter. And it turns out that it was really warm. They could sit outside in their shirt sleeves. They weren't in Europe or in the cities of England, so it started becoming very popular. Hotels grew in size. Okay. Now, on this side of the water, the Atlantic, our origins go back as well, especially in mountain communities with the sport of skiing. Uh, towns like Laporte in the Sierra Nevada County of near uh, Squaw Valley, Lake Tahoe, uh, there was a series of mining camps. And Scandinavian miners, they'd be chopping these snowbound communities for months at a time. You get pretty bored. So they started holding downhill ski races. And it was usually fueled by a lot of, you know, <laughs> libation. But it, then it got to be an organized event where they go from town to town every weekend in stage races. And as the mines spread from California to Nevada, Colorado, and Utah, sort of the sport of skiing in competitive events. Uh, Telluride down below here, very similar to Rawson. And well, it's, uh, the Sierra Nevada. Also, uh, the Hot Springs movement was also seized by the CPR Railway in Canada and the Union Pacific in the States. Uh, Grand Resort hotels were built in these locations, such as the Grand Springs, to increase year on annual occupancy, because these structures were getting very big, very expensive. They started introducing winter tourism. Uh, and the CPR, a uh, Swiss guides thing, thing where they actually built a community in Piedl or no, near Golden called Edelweiss. And then Field BC, it was a guides operation. Okay. Now, as part of uh, winter tourism, in 1892, uh, with the bimetallism crisis, the price of silver plummeted in Leadville, Colorado. It was a very big lead or, uh, silver mining area. The merchants by 1895 were really 
in serious trouble financially, so they staged a winter carnival. There was previous ones in St. Paul and places like that, but this was to be the biggest. And this is the ice palace. It took 250 men working around the clock for two months to build this. The uh, ice bricks were 20, 20 by 30 inches. Uh, they had displays, it was almost a trade fair, displays frozen in the ice, as well as lighting. And then of course it all went away in the spring, so it's sustainable, I guess. Okay, so, you know, interestingly enough, enough two years later, Ross had his first winter carnival picking up on the events at Leadville. It was so successful. They ran ski trains coming up from Spokane with participants as far away from Denver. It was Canada's first beginning championship ski race, organized and won by Ola Gildas, from who's the mine manager here, and he was also um, a ski champion in Norway in jumping at the age of 14. And there was events like hockey tournaments and toboggan racing. Okay, back in Europe, uh, up until, well, I guess the in the 20s, um, they started introducing more and more skiing to the resorts. A big factor that accelerated was Hans Schneider developing the Arlberg technique, which made skiing easier to learn. And events like the 1924 First Winter Olympics at Chamonix, that was how it really raised the popularity. Skiing really wasn't introduced until, into the Olympics until 1936 at Garmisch. But, back on this side of the ocean, in North America, skiing had continued on from the mining era in the turn of the century, well into the 20s. Uh, the Southern Pacific Railway organized ski trains that operated up until the beginning of World War II. Uh, ski clubs spread and small uh, facilities spread up the California coast, as well as in other mining communities. But the real I guess catalyst would be the emergence of Sun Valley. Uh, Avril Herman had uh, been the Lake, the Lake Placid Olympics, Winter Olympics in 1932 and wanted to uh, recreate his own resort for skiing solely. So Sun Valley, Idaho was the first pre planned resort. Avril Herman was chairman of the Union Pacific Railroad and he wanted to increase winter tourism, much like Van Horn did with the CPR and building Van Springs. Okay, Sun Valley is quite interesting because uh, he hired Count Felix Schwarzkopf from Austria to find a resort, and the uh, Union Pacific conductors and telegraph operators were complaining about Sun Valley, how there was just too much snow for the railway to operate. So he went and checked it out and. That's what we have today. Sun Valley is the, the first pre-planned resort in the world, purpose-built resort and design. It had the first chairlift. It was made out of a converted pine or banana belt or banana conveyor into a chairlift. Uh, it had a, an indoor-outdoor heated swimming pool. And the 230 Sun Valley Lodge was a port-in-place concrete structure made to look like uh, rustic materials. So, up until uh, World War II, skiing uh, did rise in popularity, but not very much. But during the war, America created the 10th Mountain Division, which was an Alpine division based on skiing and winter travel and winter warfare. So in that division, uh, the soldiers went to Europe, brought returned home, and many of them this is one of the biggest catalysts of developing the mountain resort industry in North America. In 1947, uh, a couple of the, the three of the veterans built Aspen Mountain in the historic mining town of Aspen. Um, 64 resorts were either built or operated by veterans of the 10th Mountain Division, including uh, Vail, Colorado which was uh, developed by Peter Seibert, another 10th Mountain Division veteran. Possibly more on him later. Uh, now this 
1960s Winter Logo is a part of the Force Magazine cover, which uh, featured the 10th Mountain Division soldiers. The 1960 Olympics was uh, held at Squaw Valley, and Walt Disney did the opening and closing ceremonies, and it was televised, the first Olympic televised. And that really, really spread the popularity or initiated it in North America. So back in uh, Europe, the post-World War II years, the French government recovered by 1947 their economy, and they wanted to develop tourism for locals because there's now a holiday pay and time off, discretionary income. They also wanted to attract foreign tourists and foreign capital. So they built Courchevel. I think about 1946 they started. It was based on a PhD in architecture dissertation done in 1942, but it was the first pre-planned resort. It was built. So in 1962, Emile Lade, who John you'll know, the ski racer, um, he was a great champion and created what was called Plan Neige, which was a public-private partnership between government and private developers. They wanted to develop 330,000 beds at high altitude, to, because even then snow is a, a concern. So the resorts, the first uh, phase were resorts like Aboreas or La Plan, to team. Uh, and I'll just scroll down. So this is some of the architecture. Uh, uh, Bellatorin is a later one, but uh, very, I guess, uh, self-contained. There's no concept of uh, village design or social spaces outside. It was strictly for winter only. Uh, Valtorin, now, there's, a compl there's complaints about the environmental destruction and damage in these high alpine resorts. And also, the government was expropriating land from the farmers, so there's a backlash about that. So they revisited Plan Neige in the early 70s and uh, decided to move it to lower elevations and create more uh, of a village atmosphere. Okay. And the architecture is what's usually called brutalist. Brutalism here, very, very present. It's not a very welcoming environment, really. Inside, I guess it would be. But, okay, so, yeah. From the late 50s to the present day, widespread development of resorts all over the world. As I mentioned, places like Vail, they went from, I think, 150 to 600 resorts during this period, uh, as well as the Alps, with many more um, resorts built, not just in France, but all over. Uh, places like Las Vegas, Argentina, we'll see more on this later, and of course, resorts in the Southern Hemisphere. Now, uh, this is Al Rain, who was the Canadian uh, National Ski Team coach back in the late 60s, early 70s. He'd been through Europe, and he'd seen the success of the ski industry and resort development as an economic generator, and also social good. So he came back and um, convinced the BC government that our mountains were at least as good as the Alps, or snow at least is good. You probably said that, right? but yeah. um, they're more friendly for sure. So Al had the first BC commercial alpine ski policy, or CASP as we know it, created. And he was the director of it, the program, uh, based out of Vancouver. And one of the first flagships was Whistler Village. Because Whistler Village had been started in 65 and had been sprawl development. And the BC government was concerned about the environmental damage. So they wanted to tie it all together and create a four season mountain resort. So the village, village was built on the existing garbage dump. So, and you know, the rest is history. But Eldon Beck, a uh, landscape architect who worked in Vail, uh, designed the original village. And that's where the gondola is now. And that is where I guess, oh, the original entrance loop was. So now, I think this is about 
800 feet, and that was 1.2 kilometers. We'll see more on that. Okay, uh, you know, Elvin's drawing look like scratches on paper, but there really is a, a very complex process to master planning. And I'll just go through resort uh, master planning briefly. The real challenge is when you get into resort community planning and replanning and revitalizing, much like Rawson is going through is going through and all these other communities, Revelstoke. So um, this is La Flanders Resort in the Andes in Mendoza province where I, I spent a few years working. And it was built originally in the mid 70s on the French high alpine model. And in the summers, it's not a very welcoming place. And neither is it in the winters because the winds at that elevation, it's not very high. Uh, they're blowing, well, Pieces of a uh, shale would be embedded in the side of the building from the winds. Um, yeah, you can see the winds here. Sometimes they get, well, a four, a four meter storm cycle is not over the question. So many, many, many challenges to consider. Um, I, I've been collaborating with uh, Beat von Allman, Allman for about 25 years. He was born and raised in here in Switzerland. His family had the Hotel Iger. But Beat was on the 1964. Swiss Olympic ski team and knew John Green's sister Nancy quite well from those days. And, um, but he's the real deal. He went on to uh, get a master's degree in mechanical engineering to design lifts and civil engineering to design roads and resorts. And uh, his process is an overlay method, which is quite common, where he, this is the mountain planning alone, where he overlaid analyzes avalanche, start and run area, ski train suitability, uh, proposed, the end up with a proposed lift system, but also solar pockets, wind, a multitude of vegetation, a multitude of considerations to be uh, incorporated and thought about in the planning. But mountain planning, that's not my thing. Oops. Um, baselines, that's where I'm most interested. Uh, the architecture, the planning, the environmental design. You know, it was to work a lot more with the sociology as well. So this is uh, the view of the deck from the Adam Danny Hotel in Jackson Hole, the valley. So the step one of the baseline process is to create a market-driven master plan. Uh, build it and they will come. That was going on, and so, to some extent it still is. Uh, during the early 80s, a lot of resorts went bankrupt because they did not analyze the real market. Um, places like Apex would use the same market catchment as a place like Red Mountain. And there just wasn't enough skiers to go around, but the plans were flexible. Okay, uh, this is what we came up with in Los Angeles. Uh, it was really constrained. To get to this point, it's pretty complex. That's the finished product. But to get to it, you have to analyze environmental concerns like avalanches that are coming down for about 4,000 feet. You know, these four meter storm cycles. Uh, we lost a couple buildings in the previous site. Uh, wetlands areas, there, there, slopes. Uh, but you analyze all that and figure out where the developable area is. Uh, you come in and do land use, like figure out what retail, where the housing goes, the parking, the green spaces. Um, they come up with building types like commercial, mixed use commercial, hillside residential, ski and ski out, mega accommodations. And then also movement systems is a big deal. Uh, various forms of movement systems, everything from shuttle buses to uh, multi-use trails to ski lifts, and the list goes on. We'll see more of that. And really, there's not a whole lot of building types. There's variants of each one of these types, but there's really just a few types. Uh, the Alaska Prince Hotel in uh, Alaska, Alaska, near Anchorage, is a classic grand resort hotel. King Fur Lodge in Fernie is a condo hotel. Mike Delich from Lawson developed that. Uh, chalets, single family houses, same sort of thing. These are cabins we did at uh, Hudson Bay Mountain Smithers. And then North Star Village in California, a classic mixed-use retail. And then 
townhomes, uh, townhomes, that's another point. Okay, movement systems. There's more than uh, illustrated here, obviously, but uh, rail's always been very popular in Europe, it's, it's coming back again. Ski in, ski out, you want to get that as much as possible in your resort. Um, mass transit, public transit, buses. Uh, vehicles, public roads. Uh, in Europe, they know how to design roads. They're a lot narrower than they are here. And more of our resorts have been really environmentally impact. Wide roads cause surface runoff, um, especially on hillside terrain. They cause visual scarring on the hillside, extra money to plow, and you don't need them. Plus, cars go real fast through them. We'll be talking about that on the walking tour later, on how to traffic calm and create a pedestrian environment. And then, of course, lift systems. Where we can use lifts, use them. And now the opportunities with e-buses, things like that are getting better. So the next step, if the master plan is really the skeleton, it's the framework of the resort in 2D, but 3D, I guess, too, if you're doing building blocks. But really, design guidelines and development regulations, that's the flesh and hair that develops form and character that goes on the, the skeleton. And this, to me, is at least as important as a master plan. Master plans always change in the process, but you have to stick to the, the guidelines. Now guidelines, they establish the theme and the imagery, the form and character of the resort. Los Angeles, we wanted a high desert look, uh, but we also wanted you know, seasonal color and lighting and uh, outdoor seating where possible, retail, you know, just a, a good ambient flavor. Okay, design guidelines also provide not just themes and architectural images and landscape, but also technical information like hillside residential design guidelines, um, environmental monitoring during the construction process, snow management, snow guidelines for snow country design. These guys didn't follow. And then, uh, this is the, the access to a set of apartments in Whistle. The snow slid off the roof and rolled back in. And then, things like commercial retail area, this is what's called the pedestrian envelope, the lower story and a half to two stories. It's so important that animated and provide interest to. We'll be talking about that a little later in here and on the walking tour. Okay, successful environmental design. <clears throat> it's you know all of the above, a good master plan, well conceived market analysis, um, application design guidelines, and it's a good balance of, of architecture and landscape architecture. One of the most interesting places I've been in my life for subdivisions in Trebo, Australia, at Ski Hill there. Really did a beautiful job using nature, bringing nature in making the roads as narrow as possible. Sundance Resort, uh, that's the film room where the Sundance Festival started. It was beautiful, it's just a, a pond, barn sitting on a pond. We saw a photo of it previously. Okay, this is unsuccessful design for obvious reasons. Uh, one of the dollar puzzles of our commercial alpine ski policy has been the master plan gets approved at the provincial level, but there's no design review of development permits and designs at the implementation phase, be it local government or provincial government. So the developer is pretty well free to do what he wants with to do with them. Often budgets are really limited. During this period, you remember a lot of uh, resorts went bankrupt, like Big Way. You just you near the whole mountain. And that elevation takes forever to go back, if ever. And same as Mount Washington, very challenging to uh, turn that. Now they all want to be summer resorts. And when there's this much damage done, it's, it'll take too long. And people just don't want to go be in an environment like that, obviously, in the summer. When you have challenges of lake resorts and ocean resorts and other forms of resorts. But as places like Panorama, Lesser, Sun Peaks are proving, Summer resorts are busier in the summer than the winter. Winter resorts are busier in the summer 
now. Ski resorts in the east of the winter. Or in the winter. Uh, I spent 10 years in China working around various resorts in China. Ski resorts, golf resorts, spa resorts, all sorts of resorts. In China, the hospitality industry, basic hospitality, is new to them. Uh, we were brought into plan the final stages of the 2020 Winter Olympic venue in Changli, China. And then my business partner, Dr. Gary Grant, stayed on for three years as COO to do startup operations management and training. And every day you have to go over the same thing he did the previous day, even setting dims on skis, because the Chinese have sworn to hospitality. Under the Mao regime, they had a, a saying called Chadaba, good enough. No, good enough. So here, at this resort, one resort in China is typical. They go in, they mow everything down, because most of the developers had been operating in cities before that. And this is karst, it's all bog, and it's just, uh, I don't know. But for most Chinese, it's their first time out in nature, so it all looks good to them. Um, step three, Anime and Koryaf with market-based amenities and activities. Uh, I keep saying market-based, it's gotta be a real market analysis. Because there's so much build it and they will come, or I have a dream, and you don't understand my dream or concept that it exists. There's been too many failures. Uh, but we've all seen activities like this. Most resort, many resorts have them. Big Way's got a very interesting new climbing wall. Uh, outdoor rink at Squaw Hour and North Star. Telluride is the, the capital of events, summer year-round events. They have 19 events year-round that are now destination trip attractions globally. People go from all over the world to see events there. Uh, Sundance, Utah, really nice setting for an outdoor amphitheater. Okay. We're all quite familiar with these, I'm sure. Another one, of course, there's always something new coming up, like now the rope courses. Tennis, tennis was dying in the 80s. People died in the 90s. Now it's coming back big again with COVID. Okay, Mountain Resort Golf, very important. Uh, it's important for summer activity, but it's really important for shoulder seasons to attract the convention center, the conference market. Uh, hotels are, the rates are lower. So the golfer, the attendees usually check to see you know, when I go there, and if they have golf, they have something to check off. But my observation is when you get to these conferences, they're having so much fun elsewhere, very few of them ever get to the course. Uh, this is a project we uh, had, done, had done, one precinct in Las Vegas Resort. I worked on it with uh, Hurst and Fry Golf Design out of Columbus, Ohio. And they made the cover of golf, golf the Smithsonian Institute magazine as the inventors or creators of environmental golf. Uh, Michael Hurston has a PhD in turf grass ecology and teaches at Harvard, so he's pretty, pretty qualified. But as well, it's the opportunity to uh, extend the season and not just have um, a clubhouse sitting here all winter. That clubhouse is a cross-country ski lodge in the winter or center, and we also put a spa along the center in, and that often would operate year-round. And then your typical residential. 25% of residents of golf course communities they find don't golf. They just want to be close to nature, such as golf course are. Okay, uh, and once again, a character board, uh, just trying to establish form and character of development. Uh, Hertz and Fry did this high desert golf course in uh, California, near Palm Desert. And very similar terrain because Los Lenas is high alpine desert. And then things like fitness facilities. Okay, resort retail. And you can see here from the 2007 Resort Development Handbook of the Urban Land Institute, shopping is the most popular year-round activity. So it's very important to get your retail mix right and the balance and the the location of the retail, so there's a synergy. Uh, people don't want to go to a resort to see franchise chains that they can see anywhere. So 
So it's a, actually experiential, experiential retail is what they call it. And we'll see an example here of a, in a second of a experiential retail. Uh, things like fromageries, patisseries. This is the Kicking Horse General Store that we designed years ago. And it's stuck inside a concrete building, but we tried to recreate the general stores of the Western Frontier. And then even if you do have a, a franchise that sells known products, make it unique, make a nice display. Okay, uh, REI in Seattle is a classic example. It's the um, flagship for REI equipment, recreation outdoor equipment. And they made their money initially as a cooperative, they still are, in Seattle, Washington, for people who wanted to go hiking and camping and climbing in the Cascade Mountains. And when it came, came time to build a bigger store, I think this was in the, the 90s, they decided that they were in the warehouse district on a gravel parking lot, and they decided to bring in the rainforest and the Cascade Mountains. And so it's heavily themed as a chalet or alpine building, and all this is man-made, the waterfalls, the elevation, because ground level is parking in the street. So it's all built up. Okay, and yeah, as you can see, there's references here to mountain architecture. Okay, so the theming is carried right through. Uh, Swiss Army watches. Well, they used to be real popular, and everybody had one and wanted one. But here, they had the, the uh, watches hanging all over the world with different times saying it's this time in Everest, it's this time in South America. It was kind of interesting. Ice axes, and then alpine landscapes, and then the children's play areas, you know, scenes from the outdoors, like tree trunks and bears and canoes. And then you can also test out your own equipment on things like indoor climbing walls. And of course, uh, a reference to uh, Mount Hood, Oregon, the hotel there with its fireplace. So it's not only just display, like you see in a big box, for convenience, it's also an experience. Okay, step four is ensure the customer's content. And this guy has been, he's been out shopping all day, and that is exhausted. Apparently, the extent of the village is only about 1.2 kilometers to be comfortable walking. But my wife has walked far further than that with my credit card shopping. Uh, okay, so this step four involves um, well, customer satisfaction, employee training, making sure pricing is right and all this, and that's one form of sustaining the, the product. Okay, but that's not what always happens. For example, uh, this is the first issue of Canadian Geographic magazine, uh, Butler, in 1980. Butler did this uh, article on the evolution of tourist resorts. And I've always, when I travel and evaluate resorts, I've always analyzed where the resort is at on this curve. Um, the discovery stage is when the first people discover you know, a venue for skiing. And then involvement is when the early adapters come in, more and more people. Development is when a lot of the housing occurs, there's massive influx. And then, stagnation, you know, facilities develop housing, uh, year-round activities, that sort of thing. Then stagnation is when issues start hitting, like housing shortages, traffic congestion, the things they associate with over-tourism start in the stagnation phase. Then you reach toward uh, the, the resort crest, and you either have immediate decline, decline, stabilization, uh, reduce growth, slowing up the growth, or rejuvenation. Um, Whistler used the Olympics to uh, probably stabilize a lot of facilities like the snowmaking, the war of loss, but really um, the seeds of decline are set as well, and, but a lot of the problems are right here in the development curve. Okay, so the Resort sustainability is what we'll be discussing at some point. Uh, in 2010, I did a presentation in Perth, Scotland, at a United Nations conference. I shared the session on 
sustainable tourism and resort development, but the overall theme of the resort or the conference was uh, global change in the world's mountains. And 560 signs came from all over the world. And I was the only, I guess, non, non environmentalist or hardcore scientist or professor. But my friend uh, wanted me to speak here because uh, Dr. Gary Grant, my business partner, and I were the only ones actually trying to implement their research. So I came up with this slide. I, I pulled the slide of that presentation. And the only thing I added was this. That's what's changed. The factors affecting mountain resort viability and resort community, by the way. This considered them synonymous now. Well, travel trends from post 911. This was presented in 2010. Global terrorism. Well, now we've got, we've got terrorism locally in Squamish. Uh, the sea the, see the sea sky got like getting cut twice. Uh, SARS, swine flu, well, now we've got COVID. Global financial crisis, that was 2008 to 13 or something. I didn't notice it, because in architecture, you never have to say you're wealthy. Or employed. But uh, anyways, rising fuel costs are still going up. Climate change, still an issue. Skiing has gotten to where it has disenfranchised a lot of people. Uh, the prices in Whistler are getting quite high. Bale's done work to fix that. Shifting demographics, one of the baby boomers weren't skiing anymore. But there could be growth in the industry. Then other resort types, people want to go down to the beaches or uh, sunny climates. OK, well, uh, the whole technology and greening of resorts, that's basically a no-brainer. It's good, because skiers aren't known to be uh, insensitive to the environment. They're out there as, as part of the nature. So if your resort is not looking good, uh, there's a lot of very discerning eyes that won't appreciate that and won't patron, patronize your resort. Uh, I look at it as a point of saving money and being efficient. Taking the money that you blow on energy or operations and putting it into uh, expanding the product, better facilities, better snowmaking, uh, better lifts, or operation and marketing. Now, why waste it? So these are the green technologies, some of them. Uh, applications to ski resorts, mountain towns. Well, this was uh, the cross country, or the Australian pavilion at uh, the Olympics in Whistler. And they later donated it as a, a ski lodge, a Nordic lodge. It's on a Nordic lodge system. But it was um, you know, a full on, self contained uh, solar building. No heating at all. It was using all sorts of recycled facilities, um, low flow fixtures, as well as uh, snow making. They have it so that you can uh, make snow without any energy at all. Now, the best company I think I've seen anywhere to address this issue for both marketing purposes, you aren't greenwashing. On occasion, some companies will be greenwashing, but it's Worcester Block Co. They put in a rubber, run of the river facility that powers all their lifts, heats and lights all their buildings, powers their electric free fleets, and puts energy back into the grid. It's just a small run of the river project. So, and they've got a very good, uh, I guess, program of recycling as well, things like that. Now, always be seizing new opportunities. As I was saying, in the Alps, um, spa and wellness, visiting the spas and hot pools, hot springs, drinking the water, that's how it all started there, really, mass, mass tourism, as we know it. In two, no, 2000, Heinz Schlutter from Schlutter Wellness, uh, he realized that by 2050, 30% of the ski resorts in Europe will be gone from global warming. So what they did was a concept called Cluster Tirol, and started building incredible spas and wellnesses. Heinz has built over 2,000 in the Alps alone. He worked with us in China, and Song Shan, uh, the head of Kung Fu faith, where they were combining uh, Kung Fu traditional medicine with contemporary wellness. Western wellness. Uh, the spa, or the wellness industry, in 2017, 16, something like that, it was $3.75 trillion. Uh, up until COVID, 
it had hit 4.5 trillion. And now the numbers aren't in, but the effects of COVID has pushed wellness, awareness of wellness and well-being into orbit. So things like wellness communities are not a process for a sector within uh, the wellness industry. So that, the application to mountain resorts is really significant. We can talk about that later. Uh, the various forms of wellness. On the left is the types of services. The bottom is more new age, uh, things like meditation, counseling. Uh, and then it, that's what the wellness component. But then it transitions into more of our traditional Western medicine, which is more reactive and proactive. It's getting more and more proactive, though, influenced by the wellness industry, I believe. The types of facilities on the bottom as well, versus hospitals on the top. The bottom, ashrams, uh, destination spas, the top hospitals. Um, yeah, it's hard, hard to see that. Okay. We can come back to it. But really, you know, that's all interesting. But uh, this Telluride ad came out, I think it was 2007. And uh, those, those of you can't see it, it says, remember what ski resorts were like before they uh, grew six lane highways with Dr. Ellen's stores? We do. Uh, visit Telluride, or get here, the top says, get here before Starbucks does. <laughs> so, you know, to me that says it all. In my 45 years of touring these areas, it's been like, I guess, time lapse photography. You see the authenticity of uh, in place eroded over time. There's little, little decisions to do this. Little decisions, bad, poor decisions. And probably because the community didn't really understand what made them authentic. And the uh, environmental design determines required to protect that. We'll talk about this later because it's uh, really the key of it all. Okay, um, maintaining authenticity. Uh, as I mentioned, I've been observing amenity migration to gateway communities. Now, gateway communities is a term in the states. And that a gateway community is uh, defined as a community under 25,000 people, a community within 10 miles of a lake monument uh, or ski area, and uh, at least 15 miles away from a designated urban area. In other words, a lot of BC have gateway communities. All the Columbia Basin does. Okay, so recently with COVID, really amenity migration in gateway communities is what they're now calling Zoom towns. Towns like Bozeman, Montana are now called Bos Angeles. Because over the last few, and okay now, the amenity migration I've watched setting up, you know, we had waves of people move here. I remember the first big wave of Egbert and those guys came in the early 70s as, you know, a little older than teenagers or you know, college students at Selkirk who wanted to be near a ski hill and a mountain community. So they moved to Rawson and uh, now they're senior members of the community, grandchildren. But with gateway communities now, 5G internet, uh, cell phones, improved air service, uh, improved navigations, improved roads. These are all making work easier and have been making remote work easier. Dr. Rao's first, I guess, consulting out of Whistler, we were what they called in the industry road consultants. You work in an office in a big city. No, because you're up you know, in the mountains. But now, uh, this is, was recently published in Fast and Company. Zoom towns are exploding in the West. Well, it's something that we knew, but now they are exploding. And with COVID, the demographics, uh, in August alone, this past August, one in every seven, or one, one in every 14, 7% of the accommodations in restaurant industry in America, one or one every fourteen quit in one month. Apparently, in September, the numbers are higher, and a lot of them are young kids because they don't make that much money. 
And um, they're early enough in life to do other things, like move to a town like this. And the younger generation are heavily influenced by pursuing entrepreneurship because the role of work has changed so much. Uh, big businesses are now 60%. Well, I've got all the statistics. Uh, we can go over later if you're interested. But the wave of entrepreneurialism is rising so fast. Traditional jobs are, just aren't often an option anymore. So we've seen that with companies like Kamenko. Small businesses are defined as 500 employees or less. But most of the small businesses, I think it's 60%, are one or two, sole proprietorship of two people. OK, um, yeah, I just pulled this off of the Atlantic on October 16, 2021. Uh, McKinsey did a study called uh, The Great Resignation, and it explains you know, what's really happened. Okay, so what's the role of uh, these small communities? And amenity migration. Well, people moving to, I don't know if you can read that, but um, they like main street settings, they like small towns, they like walking towns. Because now uh, a lot of the, the people would rather be on e-bikes than owning or having to be responsible for the car. Uh, there are several factors to make up an entrepreneurial ecosystem to attract high-value, low-impact new residents. Um, I say high-value, low-impact because uh, they're very fitting in with the culture and the values. Or, or should be. Uh, I guess, really, to be honest, we don't want to end up like an Okanagan. Okay, um, at least I, I wouldn't want to be. Uh, part of the factors that contribute or make up an entrepreneurial ecosystem is government policy, uh, local and global markets, human capital and workforce, education and training, uh, universities as a catalyst, physical environment or place in the appropriate setting, and this is the most overlooked apparently, um, regulatory framework and infrastructure, funding and finance, culture, and mentors, advise, advisors, and support systems. Um, in 2017, I did a feasibility study for uh, Community Futures for uh, Innovation Center in Revelstoke. And it was kind of marginal, uh, but, and they were more oriented towards tech, just tech, not tech and Google, but technology. And I got thinking, you know, wait a minute, uh, a flying steam shovel, a helicopter was invented <clears throat> in these towns. Sun Valley, Scott Ski Boots, you know, Warren Miller. All these entrepreneurs got their start and invented new things. So then I started looking at the basin, Columbia Basin, how to, uh, unify everything, the universities, um, the, the workers, the maker spaces, co-working, all the sort of stuff that's going on, a lot of the um, mentors and entrepreneurs that were going on, like Brian Cry, who's in the room. And really, from there, I looked at Jackson Hole, Sun Valley, Bozeman, Montana, these ski towns. But the real one is the Southwest Colorado Innovation Quarter, uh, based in Telluride. And it's amazing how they've unified all these components into one entity. And their uh, mentors and angel funders are, are people from Silicon Valley, uh, former heads of NASA. Why? They have their, their pitches in the gondola of Telluride. In other words, all these, uh, <coughs> excuse me, Globally qualified people want to go to Telluride to ski and participate in these, uh, I guess, events. But um, for these towns, that's a tremendous opportunity to revitalize. And these essays come from um, the Main Street America movement or institute. They're only four to five pages long, very easy reading. And if any of you are interested, I've got them all PDF. You can just email them to you. Okay, so uh, to transform the community, there's four, four types of things that have to be done. Um, 
the economic vitality, which steps in there, uh, organization, things, things like developing downtown clubs, promotion, marketing, and then design, of course, that's the area I'm interested in. Okay, so a case study. Um, Michael Delich from, he just grew up down on the hill, <coughs> below the hill here. He was um, in management at, in a mine, in a coal mine in the Curtin, or in East Curtin, as far away I think it was. The <coughs> coal prices dropped, the mine shut down. He was wondering what to do. Well, we all grew up ski racing here, and he was heavily involved in the ski racing program in Bernie. He had two kids, uh, two daughters, and um, they were involved. He was also FIST TD for Canada, for Calgary, Turin, I think they're sending him to China. Uh, so I said to Mike, I said, Mike, why don't you start developing in Fernie Snow Valley? You know, Heiko needs help, Heiko Sosher. So <clears throat> he um, convinced Heiko to hire him as a development manager. They, they hired Eldon Beck, the designer of Worcester Village, and I. The first master plan, and uh, we started in and we did it, the first set of condominiums for Mike, and we had them so they could be pre sold and not, I mean, to be built until they were sold, so they're sectional. <coughs> I think there was 150 to start with, and that got the resort started. And then we kept involved with Karen Lee Gardner, uh, designing our hotel over the years. And, but, you know, we had the ski hill going, it was getting. It had its own sort of inertia. So Mike looked at downtown. He was really intrigued with downtown Fernie, because he grew up in downtown Austin. So he bought this store. And this is the original storefront on Main Street. <coughs> Fernie's Main Street is, is a Victorian architecture town like Main Street, like Russell, like Nelson, like Revelstoke. So, but over the years, uh, renovations occur. Buildings burn as they have on Columbia Avenue here, and rebuilt. So Mike bought this and said, what are we going to do with this? He said, well, and he wanted some sort of theme building. So I said, well, why don't we do a Victorian building? So it fits in. So we studied general stores, because we wanted to do the Fernie General Store, which was good, you know, because Mike had this vision of theme retail. He'd been to travel around the world and meticulously took pictures and notes. So we uh, came up with this drawing of a Western Commercial Falls Front building that we call the Western Vernacular. If you saw my, or listened to my presentation last March on the Miners Hall and uh, the courthouse, I touched on this as part of the, the building fabric of Boston. Um, it forms uh, <coughs> the pedestrian angle of that drawing once again. A lot of animation occurring in here. Uh, things like Clerestory lighting and take it back further in the store. Uh, wood mullions. Uh, plate glass window, but you know, pretty well needed for thermal capacity. Uh, big lighting. And we had a canopy on there for 1.2, I think. And then also benches for people to sit because these, uh, these towns need sitting areas and congregation spaces, Main Street. And then, uh, as you notice, we wanted to transition between this building here and then this building here. So we elevated the parapet just so it stepped and stuck out of it and defined itself. Recessed doorway, that was nice. Nice wood features. Okay, so, uh, yeah, we, that's what the rendering looks like. <coughs> we had um, special brackets made, period brackets, dentals. There's a, a woodworker in Fernie who was really good, so he was great to work with. Your signage and your craftsmanship is only good as your local resources. There's a lot of people in these towns that are good. Uh, we split up the CRUs inside, so rather than having one big section, we split them into uh, a section on the right, an aisle or sort of a shopping area, open air shopping, and then Another section on the, or the right here. Uh, actually, Gabriella, just before she moved to Rawson, she was here. This is Ghost Rider Gifts. 
uh, specialty store on clothing, higher end clothing and uh, tourist items. This is what it looked like, but unfortunately the contractor made an executive decision and didn't elevate the tariff of the extra 18 inches. So it now lines up with, the Asgill lines up that building. So it kind of looks squashed. You know, to a trained eye, there's something funny about it. We're still, we're still happy with it. And so is Mike, that's me. Another view of it, but also, if you notice, in the picture before, this building was pretty run down and stuck on all that. <clears throat> Mike's first building, that was the first renovation on Main Street. Now all the other buildings, adjacent or most of them, have gone through the same process. And now, patios have popped up on the street, and there's street light. <clears throat> because this entrepreneurial ecosystem is uh, built in this manner, for pedestrians and street light and interaction, with uh, a lot of new kids moving up, starting their own business businesses like uh, tap houses or art galleries. Uh, this is a good day on Fernand Main Street. Okay, uh, yeah, a few more types of uh, businesses. Once again, patios are big. They're really important to have. Really important. And in Worcester, we have them. We were designing them for year-round use. And during inclement weather, when in the fall or even the winter, they'd be empty. But once we put uh, heat laters in, even heated furniture at some point, um, one of my clients was made an extra five thousand dollars a day in revenue just from his patio. Mind you, the price Worcester charges was not a lot. <laughs> not a lot of meals. Uh, and now. This is the iconic photo of Fernand. Usually, um, the ski hills in the background is in the picture, but this was out of, um, I think, tourism in British Columbia. But that's the classic shot. Mike tells me that uh, that's the most photographed building. Okay, so on that, um, with these decisions, uh, really, yeah, this is a, of Squaw Valley, but the decision for Rossum, and I think the future with this possible immigration diaspora of people from uh, cities and uh, suburbs will now migrate into these small resume towns. Um, I guess I, I think it's time for people to make decisions on the way they want to evolve. I know they have been, but I still I see things happen in these communities where they're just not on preservation in place or you know as a focus. People talk about it, but you know, I've just seen too much over the years. I know in Whistler, uh, I just watched it decline. As people move in, from where they've come, Whistler's better than where they've come. It's the best thing since sliced bread, they think. But yet they always bring in different views, and slowly the original people that came for appreciation of the mountains and small town, that is evolving, evolving, evolving. Uh, the congestion there now, it's, um, I don't know, not my cup of tea. So, at that, uh, questions?